I want to uh, introduce now Mike Teets, who's going to introduce Sir Peter Hall. Uh, Mike is Professor Emeritus of City and Regional Planning. He's also a senior fellow and former director of research at the Public Policy, of, Pol Public Policy Institute of California, which has uh, grown to become a major force in pub for public policy in this state, and uh, an institute which he helped plan and establish. Um, Professor Teets joined the college, I think, Mike, 1963? January. January 1963. Um, and his research and innovative thinking has shaped generations of planners and urban policymakers. And his gentle hand has guided many students who have gone on to become distinguished practitioners and scholars of cities uh, and planning. Now, I was lucky enough to meet Mike in the late 1970s. And I also spent time with him during a sabbatical at IURD in the early uh, 1980s. Um, I was a kind of wet behind the ear, ear is PhD, and um, he was incredibly generous to me. I remember uh, giving a seminar, and I had a huge, complicated model up on the, uh, on the blackboard, arrows and boxes, and it was just wild. And after the talk, Mike said, hmm. Jen, big model. And then he went on to talk about why it might be easier to think about it in, in more straightforward ways um, and help me think about how I might um, simplify and make, make my model and my thinking more parsimonious. And um, I am incredibly grateful for his help. His own recent research has been in the fields of regional planning, local economic development, and housing planning and policy. Um, he wrote an influential book on rent control, residential rent control, and he's written numerous papers and uh, reports and served as a consultant and advisor to local, state, and national governments, both here in the US and internationally. And he's also provided um, a lot of advice to nonprofit as well as private sector organizations. Um, so I am really delighted to turn the podium over to Mike to introduce Peter. It's my pleasure, obviously, to introduce Peter Hall. I don't know what you're talking about me for. Um, so what can one say about Peter Hall, Sir Peter Hall? He's a professor, first and foremost, I think, professor uh, at the Bartlett School of the at University College London, where he's professor of planning and regeneration. Uh, nobody says anywhere I can find what kind of regeneration, but I, I think knowing Peter, it's all kinds of regeneration. He was also, uh, had a mighty impact, as you hear, as professor at DCRP in the college from 1980 to 1982, when he decided, sadly, to move back. What does Peter do? Well, first, he's probably the preeminent scholar and historian of planning and urbanism, perhaps in the world today. Uh, he's written almost 30 books. I notice many, many of them have been reprinted, some over and over. Among them is the standard history of city planning that everybody uses, and it's a wonderful book. I'm using it now in the course I'm teaching. Most recently, he wrote uh, Cities in Civilization, which is a really magisterial examination of the role of cities in the development of civilizations. Uh, a wonderful book. He continues to do influential and major research, vacuuming up money from the, from, uh, the EU uh, to study information and its flows across cities and city systems. In, in particularly in Europe. He's world famous. He has 14 honorary degrees. Uh, Queen Elizabeth knighted him in 1998 for services to the Royal Town Planning Institute. Exactly what those services were wasn't made entirely clear, <laughs> but actually he was knighted, I think, because he'd been a tremendously influential advisor to the British government, both parties, for decades before then. 
He has the gold medal of the Royal, Institute, uh, Royal Town Planning Institute, the first one that was awarded in 20 years. Uh, he's a Patrick Abercrombie Prize winner from the International Union of Architects. But more than this, Peter is a mover and a doer. Um, as I said, he's been a key planning advisor to UK governments both, for both parties. Uh, he was very influential and worked on the whole question of the uh, channel tunnel terminal and the railroad to London, a tremendous task, and the extraordinary crossrail project in London. Most recently, he's been an advisor and working on a very typical project for Peter, uh, an advisor to Lord Adonis, who is the British Minister of Transport, uh, looking at historic and very special railroad stations in, in Britain. And uh, when I visited him recently, he had come back that day from Liverpool and was leaving the following morning for Cardiff to do, do it. And that's typical of Peter, a tremendously vigorous and energetic person. I recall uh, once Mary and I visited Peter and Magda in London, and we all decided, well, Peter decided, we were going to drive 350 miles on British roads. Uh, no fun. Um, what were we going to see? A public housing project. <laughs> in fact, it was Biker Wall, which is no mean public housing project, but still a public housing project. Uh, however, before we left, Peter insisted and Magda fumed uh, that we had to drive to the local public library in order for him to pick up an armload of books uh, that we would carry with us and consult in the car on the way up. Well, on the way, of course, we had to make a stop at Milton Keynes, uh, the famous new town in, in, on, in Britain. However, I think my most pleasurable memory in some ways, and it, perhaps the most telling memory of Peter, I think, and he's here, so this is not a memory of the past Peter, it's the present Peter. Uh, my office used to be on the northwest corner of Worcester Hall, and to get to it, you had to walk through a studio, which I think is wonderful. All, all faculty should have offices where you walk to them through studios. We sort of peer, and you could make Jake mad by showing up at the wrong moment and stuff like that. Um, and I was wandering through there one day in the late 80s, early 90s. I looked at it, what are you guys doing? They're drawing lines on big maps of California. Uh, what were they doing? They included Brian Taylor, now a, a professor at UCLA, and others. They were doing the first routing and assessment for high-speed rail in California. At that time, nobody dreamed that high-speed rail could really ever happen in this state. But they had the route all laid out, and they were pretty accurate, it turns out. And so, I think for me, the right introduction for Peter is that I give you the father-to-be of high-speed rail in California, <laughs> Peter Hall. Uh, Dean Walsh, uh, Mike, and uh, very many uh, friends. Uh, and former colleagues in the audience. I can't say what a huge pleasure it is to come back to Berkeley at any time, but particularly at this very auspicious occasion. I know it's an occasion tinged with sadness because of the events uh, that have struck the California economy and with it, the University of California. Uh, but I am one of those that like to think that uh, California and this university will see better times uh, before long. Uh, and in saying this, I would like to um, commemorate uh, the college uh, as uh, an example of what a college truly is and should be, and that is an assemblage of scholars um, pursuing their individual lines of research, but in a form of deep exchange of ideas and knowledge. <clears throat> 
That is what CED was founded to do uh, 50 years ago and what it so triumphantly continues to do today. Now, in uh, considering what to say today, I, um, took, I'm going to take a rather different line from the one Dell has taken uh, because I'm going to try to zoom out to look at the whole history of planning from an intellectual point of view uh, over uh, 100 years uh, because I believe that the prehistory before 1959 is as important as the history in which um, uh, the, uh, uh, we're, we're considering. And uh, I see originally, a, 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 and I'm going to discuss here uh, and I have a horrible feeling that we have the wrong version <laughs> of this presentation. <laughs> um, but uh, let's see. Huge apologies for this, uh, because uh, all the work I did uh, to finalize the presentation seems to have somehow blown away in the version you're now seeing. Uh, but what I am going to talk about is three episodes, and in fact a fourth, uh, over the course of the uh, last century. Uh, and um, I'm going to take these very quickly, even faster in turn, uh, and try to understand what was important about each. 100 years ago, the overwhelming issue, uh, both here in the United States and in Europe, was the housing issue. And the key individuals were Ebenezer Howard, an iconoclast who belongs in a tradition of his own, Raymond Unwin, his architect. Interestingly, um, French regional geography, this is where geography uh, related to planning for the first time through Patrick Geddes, and a very important tradition, and through Geddes, to Lewis Mumford and through Lewis Mumford to the Regional Planning Association of America. Now, the housing issue, well known to everyone, the creation of smokestack cities, smokestack towns with appalling housing conditions. <laughs> uh, sorry, we're going very fast. Uh, and the first attempts around 150 years ago to produce model tenement housing, which often reproduce many of the problems uh, that they were meant to solve. Then, uh, 111 years ago, comes Ebenezer Howard uh, in the book that made him famous uh, under uh, the uh, revised uh, title of 1902. But that vision was partially lost, uh, as I'll try to argue very quickly now. Um, Howard's vision, uh, famously encapsulated in the three magnets, was that both uh, the late uh, 19th century town and the late 19th century countryside had um, huge advantages and huge disadvantages. But it was possible to combine them in a third form, town country, uh, that um, combined all the advantages with few of the disadvantages. It seems very quaint today, uh, but it's an interesting exercise with students to reproduce the, di the magnet diagram uh, for the conditions of the early 21st century. And I can assure you it works just as well now as it did then. Howard brought together very different influences, uh, often of equally iconoclastic 19th century figures uh, who had written on the land question. And uh, the land and land value questions were actually as apposite in uh, late 19th century England uh, as was the housing question uh, because the uh, huge uh, monopoly rents or oligopoly rents, I should say, that landowners made from exploiting land values uh, were at the key of the problem of housing in these cities. And already uh, an economist like Alfred Marshall had proposed moving the poor out from London. Uh, and this combined uh, with another thinker, the anarchist thinker uh, Peter Kropotkin, who argued that new technologies could transform geographical space, particularly by electrification and better transportation, allowing people to live and work in the countryside. So that Garden City, his vi Howard's vision, uh, was an extremely compact city. It's a mistake to think it was a low-density city with homes and uh, jobs and public services extremely close at hand within walking distance. And in this sense, uh, you would have to say that it was a model sustainable city in early 21st century terms. Further, it was uh, surrounded by a huge green belt, which would be intensively used for quasi-urban purposes. 
Um, uh, Howard was hugely influenced, interestingly, by the example of Adelaide, uh, 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 the capital of South Australia, a place he'd never visited but heard of, uh, where the planner, um, uh, Colonel William Light, had built a city and then a satellite city next door. And Howard's notion, therefore, uh, was that uh, these uh, garden cities could infinitely multiply on cheap agricultural land. And furthermore, since the community would own this land, rises in land value, which would normally accrue to the landlord, would accrue to the community and allow the creation of a local uh, cooperative welfare state. That was the most important part of Howard's vision, totally lost, unfortunately, in what happened afterwards. Uh, Howard got his garden city realized at Letchworth, some 35 miles north of London, from 1903 onwards, uh, designed by two uh, great architects in the neo-vernacular tradition, Raymond Unwin and Barry Parker. And they created an idyllic uh, Elysian kind of settlement whose qualities survive to this day if you visit Letchworth. Um, but the jobs were slow in coming, and this uh, finally gave the industrialists too much power, which allowed them to, in effect, um, destroy Howard's original vision of using rises in commercial rents uh, to pay for social services. Although he was somewhat more successful in a second garden city in Wellin, uh, even nearer to London, it became uh, much more of a commuter settlement uh, than Letchworth had, which really destroyed the point of the exercise, despite its tremendous environmental qualities. Because the one of the paradoxes of of the new towns, of the garden cities and the new towns that followed them, was always uh, to put them in a location where they could be reasonably self-contained and avoid the need for long distance commuting. Uh, but in order to do that, uh, you had to be absolutely sure that enough local employment was available. And this became increasingly uh, difficult uh, as we moved from an industrial era where most people did the same jobs in the same kinds of factories to the modern post-industrial era. But the final part of the vision, to repeat, was the notion that once, once one garden city was complete, then it should be followed by another and another and another. And this was a process that go, could go on infinitely. Um, and it, it gave this advantage that each um, garden city would be reasonably self-contained, but they would be related through what Howard called uh, an intermunicipal railway, or in effect, a, a rapid transit system, which would give all these settlements collectively the advantages of a very big city of uh, 250,000 in this case, or even a million and more as the social city multiplied. And you can see something of this vision realized if you go uh, out of Heathrow on a plane towards mainland Europe and the plane goes through a U-turn and on your left is actually Howard's Garden City realized, the two garden cities of uh, Letchworth uh, and Wellin and the two post-World War II new towns of um, Hatfield and Stevenage all out there arrayed along a single rail line. Uh, now, that tradition was in part borrowed in its, um, in its uh, architectural uh, manifestations in early experiments here in the uh, US in Forest Hills Gardens in New York, uh, uh, which uh, saw the birth of the neighborhood unit principle, very importantly, Cl Clarence Perry, who intellectualized it at the end of the 1920s. The actual development was earlier. Uh, and then, followed by Sunnyside Gardens, uh, developed by the pioneers in the Regional Planning Association of America in the uh, mid-1920s, uh, which in turn uh, uh, emboldened them to the even more uh, drastic experiment of creating their own garden city in Radman, New Jersey, which was to be built on the British principle as a, a, an isolated garden city, uh, in fact, lacking the jobs and in the uh, project, as many of you will know, was never finished. It was hit by the Great Depression. Uh, but it remains a remarkable place in its architectural vision because of its remarkable segregation of pedestrian and vehicle traffic, which gave its name to the Radburn layout. Uh, very, very influential in Great Britain after World War II. 
Uh, and of course, the Greenbelt towns, although never completed as uh, President Roosevelt uh, intended them, there were only three, uh, were other remarkable cases which put America at that time uh, ahead of Europe uh, and certainly ahead of Britain in thinking about how to relate uh, buildings, open spaces, including communal spa open space, and the whole uh, related to the uh, big city next door, in this case, of course, Washington, D.C. Um, but um, there was an even more radical departure here in the U.S. Um, these are pictures of Greenbelt, realized brilliantly with very advanced architecture for the time, which compares with the best German examples uh, of the 1920s. But the real uh, uh, revolution came in a slightly different way through the strange visionary Scots um, biologist uh, planner, Patrick Geddes, and his work on survey, uh, urban survey, from the top of his Outlook Tower in Edinburgh, today uh, preserved as a tourist attraction, ironically. And uh, from that, um, uh, Geddes' vision of the planning of an entire natural region uh, from um, a mountain down to seaport as a single region. Uh, that, uh, ske sketched out in very intuitive terms, um, had a tremendous influence on Lewis Mumford, who began to correspond with Geddes and even organized a rather chaotic visit by Geddes to America in uh, the early 1920s. But um, Mumford essentially did what Geddes could never do, uh, give coherence uh, to the concept. There's uh, Mumford towards the end of his career at a conference in 1965. Uh, here below are two of the key people he collaborated with, um, Clarence Steen and Benton McKay, the biologist, and perhaps the most distinguished of all, uh, who we should celebrate today, uh, Catherine Bauer, who of course became, uh, as, as we've heard from Dell, became uh, Catherine Bauer Worcester, who was actually, in real practical terms, the most influential of all this group, because she left them, she broke away to go to Washington and wrote the 1937 Housing Act. But meanwhile, the intellectual influence, uh, particularly through uh, Benton McKay's thinking um, of the uh, adaptation of the Valley Section Principle to uh, New York State in the New York Regional Plan, which FDR commissioned as governor in the 1920s, was absolutely huge. And once again here, um, the United States was far ahead of European principles uh, and, and practice in the late 1920s. Uh, Geddes, meanwhile, towards the end of his life, uh, founded a rather strange, apparently rather bizarre uh, college in Montpellier in southern France where he hoped to teach and exchange ideas on the uh, ideas he'd helped develop. It was uh, visited by enthusiastic groups of British geographers, uh, but um, Geddes uh, died in 1932, and it really had very little influence. So what influence Geddes had, and it was considerable, was essentially through uh, the American route. One irony, however, of this is that the RPAA um, combined a, an interesting respect for natural environment with a rooted belief in new technology. And the uh, New York Regional Plan argued for parkways to be extended across the state uh, and used as the basis of chains of new settlements, uh, really echoing Howard's idea of the social city. But none of it ever happened after FDR moved uh, from Albany to Washington. And ironically, the parkways were realized around New York City by a totally antipathetic figure, highly antipathetic to the RPAA, uh, Robert Moses, who actually succeeded in doing them, but without the vision uh, uh, of, a, uh, of a planned series of settlements uh, which the RPAA thought they would give rise to. Uh, and that was, is one of the many uh, ironies of planning history, I think, that a brilliant idea uh, either doesn't get carried through, or when it gets carried through, it gets carried through essentially in the wrong form. So uh, the vision of uh, the RPAA 
um, uh, ha, um, uh, has really essentially been lost. Uh, ironically, it was taken up by another influential figure uh, that did not belong to this group, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, who uh, commemorated the uh, universal automobility of Los Angeles in the 1920s and used it as the basis uh, for his Broadacre City uh, concept. Uh, and this was in turn taken up at the very influential New York World's Fair of 1939 by Norman Baghettis, uh, and uh, ironically uh, became the vision that inspired not only the Los Angeles freeway system, but the interstate highway system after World War II. Uh, I'm going to return to that later, but uh, the irony was that uh, right like the RPAA, but in a rather different way, saw the uh, automobile as a great liberator, allowing people to spread out of congested cities. That was the essence of Broadacre City. Uh, but what really happened uh, was the kind of sprawl that uh, was already beginning to happen around Phoenix, Arizona, where, as many of you will know, uh, Wright established his great workshop, Talion II, and by the end of his life and his career, he was bemoaning uh, the beginnings of this sprawl, uh, which perhaps is the most uh, apt example of hypersprawl in the whole of the United States of America, far exceeding the relatively high density Los Angeles. So so there were all kinds of ironies in the uh, American thinking of that time. Meanwhile, um, another key figure, Frederick Osborne, who had also um, corresponded with Mumford, they, set, uh, they established a great transatlantic fr friendship. Os Osborne, who was a great doer, influenced Patrick Abercrombie, uh, my predecessor at University College as Professor of Planning, in his uh, Greater London Plan of 1944 with its vision of eight new towns and many other town expansions of similar character, which equally remarkably the UK government carried out, of course, in the years after World War II. So in a strange way, the vision of Howard and the vision of RPAA bounced back across the Atlantic uh, to create a remarkable urban form in the London region in those 15 years after World War II. Now, the, uh, meanwhile, as everyone knows, uh, Le Corbusier in France uh, was establishing uh, an, an argument for a different kind of very high density urban vision. Um, uh, well, Cabusier was as unsuccessful practically as he was brilliant in uh, idea generation. Uh, he never developed the settlements he wanted. He never found his Louis XIV. Uh, there was a dangerous collaboration with Vichy France during World War II, which is rather washed over. Uh, but essentially, uh, what happened was uh, the single famous uh, Unité d'Habitation at Marseille, and I think you can see some homage to that in uh, William Worth. Uh, design for this building, um, <laughs> uh, uh, perhaps uh, a similar brutalism. Interestingly, although it provided a model for much other generally public housing after World War II, the Unité was designed for relatively affluent middle class inhabitants and still is uh, occupied by them with an elegant cafe you can see here, much frequented by architecture students, um, and a, a, a view of the parkland all around that occupies 95% of the space. So this was a realization. Uh, and it, it still is, a, as preserved architectural monument by the French state, a, a remarkable place to go and visit. Although I would say that if you do go there and you make the, um, uh, have the adventure of staying in the Le, uh, Le Corbusier Hotel, which does occupy one floor of this building, it is somewhat uh, of a nightmare uh, to live in a beton brew building in the Mediterranean summer. Don't go, go there in July, August. Meanwhile, well, however, um, um, uh, that vision was being uh, copied very successfully by the London County Council Architects Department and much less successfully by many other public authorities, uh, not only in the UK but all over Europe. And it has to be said uh, that many of these proved to be uh, great planning disasters, although equally so, the better of them, particularly most of the LCC architects department uh, imitations, have weathered relatively well. 
I must push on, and they, what was happening uh, after World War II was something, I think, new and very important. It was essentially a, a funny kind of union of a few special people, uh, engineers, uh, physicists in some cases, uh, and geographers, who developed a new uh, sc uh, school of quantified analysis of urban space, particularly using the first now very primitive computers uh, to generate models of urban development, which were then applied to transportation studies. Uh, the daddy of them, uh, uh, well, the, 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 uh, perhaps one of the key founding fathers uh, who never taught here was Brian J. L. Berry, who moved from uh, UCL, where he, he got his undergraduate education through the Was University of Washington to Chicago. Uh, but then uh, William Garrison, who uh, supervised his PhD uh, at uh, Washington and afterwards uh, moved here to a very distinguished career in Berkeley. And on the UK side, Peter Haggett with his famous book, Location and Models in Human Geography, 1965. These and others um, were actually joined, and here we should commemorate uh, someone not with us tonight, Melvin Weber, uh, uh, my colleague and great friend at IURD, uh, who actually acted as a theorist for this kind of uh, approach, although he was himself never a quantifier. Uh, but he was, if you like, provided a kind of philosophical underpinning for what they were essentially trying to do. What they were trying to do uh, was uh, in the uh, Chicago Area Transportation Study, which was the first uh, um, directed by J. Douglas Carroll, uh, to develop uh, uh, models uh, which would logically predict uh, how land use would develop, uh, particularly as a result of the investment that was just going to go, uh, just beginning to go in uh, as a result of the Interstate Highways Act of 1956, here being signed by President Eisenhower. And um, essentially, they provided an underpinning uh, for vast expansion of urban freeway and expressway systems, not only in American cities, uh, but also in a city like London. Uh, and very importantly, London was the scene where, or, or, or one of the scenes where this approach uh, was fought over in the late 1960s and actually beaten down so that the same politicians who were proposing 2,000 miles of motorways in London in 1965 were abandoning the plan in 1973. And that is a very significant development indeed. But meanwhile, in the UK, a generation of geographer planners, uh, including Brian McLaughlin and uh, Michael Batty, were actually developing the concept from pure transportation studies to modeling the whole development of regions and sub-regions. And there was a great rash of these really quite important studies in England in the late 1960s, some of which had quite substantial results on policy. But then, um, came uh, what you can call a counter-revolution. Uh, and the counter-revolution came uh, through various agencies, one of which was the remarkable work of Jane Jacobs, uh, who everyone knows, uh, in her book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, 1961, who mocked both the uh, uh, Howard traditions and uh, Howard tradition and the Corbusier tradition, uh, and argued for a preservation of the traditional qualities of the American city. Uh, this was an outcome of a huge battle she fought with um, Robert Moses in his la latter years uh, to try and force an expressway through her beloved um, Greenwich Village in New York City. Uh, but um, uh, she actually succeeded in that, and she proceeded to intellectualize it. But she actually was uh, what became the great disciple of local community movements and anti-centralized planning, the kind of top-down, big planning, big models, uh, big um, highway systems, uh, big urban destruction uh, that uh, had characterized the previous era. 
and she, of course, proved remarkably successful. And you can say that in some ways her approach represented a tradition to what Patrick Geddes in his work in India, which I haven't mentioned, called conservative surgery for cities. Um, but what she did was, in effect, stood planning on its head. And this resulted uh, after 1970 in a period of turmoil in many European cities. Uh, epic planning uh, fights uh, as in the plan, the plan for Covent Garden in London, where the Greater London Council proposed effectively the demolition of a huge area of the historic city. Uh, it was preserved uh, at the end of that battle. The GLC planners were beaten down, the highway planners were beaten out, and uh, Covent Garden was restored uh, as a result of a huge community battle. Irony, uh, ironically, the people who fought that battle then lost it because the um, little shops and businesses that they'd started uh, were a victim uh, of the rising rents that resulted from the very success of the project. Another example, I'm afraid, of unintended consequences in planning. But what was happening in these years was that planning was stood on its head in very many different ways. These were the years of the Marxist ascendancy here at Berkeley and in many other universities. Uh, the, later, they were the um, uh, places where uh, different approaches, such as communicative communicative planning, uh, argued for by Jürgen Habermas in the United States, enormously influential here when I was teaching in the mid-80s, uh, and uh, taken up uh, by um, uh, academic planners such as John Forrester in Cornell and Patsy Healy over in the UK at the University of Newcastle. Very, very influential in showing how local groups could come together to take effective action. But finally, um, uh, resulting in uh, a tremendous antipathy, an anti-reaction to uh, the Cor Corbusian dream, symbolized by the demolition of one of the biggest high-rise, uh, high-density projects, the Pruitt Igo in St. Louis, uh, in 1972. And that was followed by many other such demolitions in the years that followed. But the strange thing at this point and in fact, um, it was a great retreat and a great divorce, is that in this um, turning of planning on its head, uh, uh, because uh, centralized planning was associated with uh, the war machine, and this was all uh, mixed up with the huge debate here over the Vietnam War, and Mumford, who by this time had himself um, reversed his position, no longer believed in the automobile as an agent of of liberation, although he had bitterly uh, reviewed Jane Jacobs' book when it first appeared, he came to adopt many of the same ideas towards the end of his life, embracing a more decentralized form of planning. But in the parallel discipline of geography, uh, the quantitative revolution was almost thrown out of the window and was replaced by, first of all, by a Marxist turn and then by a cultural turn, which led geography ever more away from any practical influence uh, on planning, and that divorce has continued in considerable degree to the present day. Uh, now, meanwhile, of course, the irony of all this was uh, that in the real world, um, the, um, uh, you had uh, Reagan uh, uh, here, President Reagan here, and Mrs. Thatcher, she was then in the United Kingdom, uh, busy um, uh, running uh, an anti-planning project. Uh, the Thatcher government famously said in 1983 that there was no need anymore for strategic planning. It was a fashion of the 1960s, the need for which had disappeared. Instead, you had quick, drastic action to bring in the private sector to turn cities around, uh, most dramatically illustrated uh, by uh, what she did uh, with private developers in the London Docklands. Uh, and I'm afraid that's the section of the, uh, this talk that you uh, would have seen, um, but unfortunately it has disappeared from this version. Uh, but that, uh, the good news is it allows us, oh, uh, we have something. Have we? Yeah, yes, I would like to look at it. Yes, thank you very much. That's brilliant of you. Yeah, and um, I, I think we are in fact seeing here um, the... Uh,
the missing slides. Uh, but uh, we better continue because the clock is ticking inexorably. Um, and um, so I want to fast forward now because the story there is that this extraordinary divorce of academic planning and the related social science disciplines from the real world uh, of, um, uh, of rampant free enterprise in the 1980s and early 90s. This divorce was slowly mended, I think, on the side of the practical planners. Uh, in England, for, for instance, um, the key politician who was responsible uh, for the London Docklands and then uh, for the much bigger Thames Gateway project and the Channel Tunnel Rail Link, Michael Heseltine, was famously described by uh, Mrs. Thatcher as not one of us. Uh, he wasn't really one of them because his belief in free enterprise was always tempered by a belief that you had to put enormous sums of public money into uh, big projects uh, and no bigger uh, sum than in the high-speed railway from the Channel Tunnel to London, which finally opened in 2007. Um, you had to do that in order to leverage funds from the private sector. And he triumphantly illustrated that that was possible in the London Docklands, particularly in the enormous Canary Wharf scheme. Uh, but successive uh, right-wing or right-of-center po uh, politicians uh, in the UK, and the same applies here, gradually moved more back towards the center in uh, their uh, rejection of the crude, uh, crudities of the original Rago Thatcher approach of the early 1980s. But meanwhile, um, we come to the final episode, which brings us right to the present day. And here I'm going to argue that despite uh, other very important priorities, such as um, handling the consequences of globalization and the huge um, disparities of income between uh, the developed and the developing world, that there is now uh, something about as compelling as the housing issue was at the end of the 19th century, and that is a challenge of global warming. But in fact, um, planners are no longer able to draw as they did uh, on a strong tradition in geography uh, because this strange um, uh, turn in the, the parallel subject of geography has continued. Um, and this is a quote from uh, Jamie Pichwa, a, a distinguished British geographer, um, saying that, in effect, British geography and uh, and global geography has somewhat lost its way. So that you find an enormous challenge almost waiting new intellectual traditions in the academy uh, being developed to um, uh, respond to that challenge. And uh, these diagrams, are, for which are, uh, you'll recognize from the Intergovernmental Commission on Climate Change, are so well known and so generally accepted uh, that I just put them in to remind us of how generally uh, this is now seen as an imperative. And every day brings new newspaper headlines in the build up to the critical Copenhagen conference in December. Um, and it raises, of course, all kinds of very, very difficult issues, uh, which echo again the kinds of debates we had 100 years ago uh, about the need for planning to uh, impose constraints on individual behavior, because uh, there is no doubt that in our own lives, uh, uh, we exhibit uh, massive uh, individual and collective hypocrisy in often saying one thing, aspiring to one thing, and doing another. Uh, not only that, but as we're seeing every day in the negotiations that are now going on in Pittsburgh, we're seeing uh, um, clashes of interest between newly developing societies uh, like China or uh, d d fully developed ones like the US and the EU nations. And the real issue of whether we can ever square this circle by developing new forms of geographical, uh, of, of, of sustainable consumption. Now, um, there are a very few places in the world, and I would have to say 
that apart from Portland, Oregon, which uh, it will be familiar to almost everyone here, um, uh, which has been developing these policies for the past uh, fully 25, 30 years. The most remarkable cases for me now are coming from a very few places in mainland Europe. And I'd like to illustrate just two of these. Freiburg in southwest Germany, close to the Swiss and French borders, has become almost uh, a, a place of pilgrimage for planners nowadays. In fact, the last time I led a group there, it was becoming embarrassing because the uh, inhabitants were almost erecting barricades to stop the eco-tourists invading their territory. Um, so go there quickly before they put a gate around the city. But the whole notion of Freiburg, which was a very, very simple one, was uh, it's a city uh, rather like Berkeley, a, a university city. The university is by far the biggest employer, and the university students and faculty have been had a disproportionate influence on university politics since the 1980s. Uh, the policy is based on uh, streetcar extensions on street and then on reserve track over quite short distances to brownfield developments in the uh, uh, middle uh, city area, only uh, two or three miles from the city center. Uh, they had good luck in having two very big brownfield sites they could develop. Uh, and uh, the most remarkable of these was uh, Vauban, southwest of the city centre, where a group of uh, extreme eco hippie activists uh, took over a French barracks uh, when the Fre called Vauban, where the French uh, uh, left uh, after the end of the Cold War and tried to create an alternative community. Um, uh, rather similar to uh, a community that uh, uh, another group created in Copenhagen that's still there. Well, the, uh, Bo uh, the uh, uh, Fry uh, Freiburg group is still there behind this fence, uh, still holed up in old army trucks and with uh, defiant slogans out to the rest of the world. But meanwhile, something remarkable happened, which was this uh, gentleman. His name is Wolf Darsiking, and he's been city planner of Freiburg for uh, 27 years now, and he has really masterminded an extraordinary approach to the planning of this city. What is it? You run the trams out, and as you see, they're green, uh, the, the streetcars out, you, and they're running on green strips in the middle of the road. And here on the side, uh, here is a uh, a, a book, uh, unfortunately only available in German, uh, about how it was all done under his guidance. Uh, the quarter of the uh, the title of the book is here: the uh, uh, ecos or, or the uh, or the eco freaks have gone crazy. Uh, but. Um, but in fact, um, what uh, has been done is something less crazy than that, which is very, very careful planning uh, in the interests of um, sustainability, uh, both in buildings and in transportation uh, and in uh, the use of uh, energy, in particular solar energy, and the water cycle. Uh, extraordinary care devoted to all these, as well as social planning in the form of schools and kindergartens. How does it work out? Well, very, very simply at one level, because the master plan simply has that streetcar turning a corner and going along uh, along um, a boulevard or, uh, or alley uh, to a turning circle at the end. And on that, uh, at right angles, are organized, um, as you see typically, uh, four-story apartment blocks and, and houses, all within a, a very short walking distance of uh, the public transportation. Uh, and the general height uh, limit and the layout are laid down by uh, Wolf's um, planners. Uh, but the detail is produced by the b building groups who are the residents themselves planning their own homes and their own environment. And this leads to an extraordinary um, subtle um, quality of design here, as you see, with different kinds of homes combined together, but all fitting comfortably together. But above all, the outstanding quality of this semi-public open space, which makes it a paradise for children. Uh, in summer, unfortunately, these were taken on a rather bleak day. The place is absolutely overrun with children, as it ought to be. Uh, and this makes it absolutely brilliant. Sorry, that number got in again. Uh, these are some private homes that were designed as a special development. Uh, uh, and um, this rather marvelous ad, 
on the site uh, says, if you can read the German, unfortunately we don't have the Garden of Eden anymore with a picture from Cranach, but we have something just about as good here. Come and buy one. And they are buying them. Um, uh, also remarkable is that the car is basically banished. Um, uh, you can have one if you like, but they make it uh, very easy to use public transportation. And a significant proportion, around two in five, of all families here do not own cars. Uh, the car is very strictly controlled through traffic calming on the spaces where it's allowed at all and is banished to huge parking garages on the edge of the development. So you have to walk to get your car, whereas if you ride a bus, you can just pick it up outside your block of apartments where you also uh, recycle all your refuse. So in many ways, a remarkable development. Equally remarkable is uh, another uh, which is becoming an equal place of pilgrimage in the city of Stockholm in Sweden, Hammarby Sjöstad, um, which bears a remarkable family resemblance to Vauban, except a bit denser. The same principle of a streetcar route along the middle of the road, De slightly denser housing here along the main street, uh, but reducing as you get away from it. Generous open space here, as you see, with the school just back of us where I took this picture, um, and uh, also in the residential areas. And as in um, uh, Freiburg, these water uh, courses are part of a recycling system for water to conserve all the rainfall that falls, which is gathered and recycled like everything else. Uh, and um, the whole um, development is planned around water, which Stockholm fortunately has plenty of. And the final remarkable feature in which Hammarby is not unique, in fact, uh, pla places elsewhere in Europe, including a couple of English cities now have this, a very sophisticated system of recycling of waste where you pop different kinds of waste in this and it's a suction system. It shoots it at tremendous speed up to a couple of kilometers in, uh, into a remarkable recycling space where it's all compressed and sent out again um, as part of a recycling model. The, uh, the, the, the planners in the Stockholm City Planning Department, who play uh, an equal role here to Wolf Darsiking's team in Freiburg, um, proudly say uh, that uh, the, what they call the Hammarby model is the most advanced in terms of the total management of the urban built environment that you can find anywhere in the world today. And I would not like to deny them that claim. If you are the next time on a visit to Europe, make an admittedly long diversion uh, to uh, um, uh, Stockholm and see it. But on the way, you might also want to visit another example, which this time is international, where um, Copenhagen in Denmark and Malmö in Sweden have come together to develop a, a new model of an eco-region uh, with model developments on either side of the water that separates them. And um, on the Copenhagen side, they've developed this remarkable linear new town on the right, uh, about three miles long but very narrow, along a new automated metro line. There it is, the trains come every few minutes, and along this line, uh, a remarkable series of developments. This is a major shopping center for the development, uh, but all served by public transportation. And here that automated train is on the upper level with an interchange down to the next stage, which is a regional metro system that will whisk you, here's our study tour group, ready to be whisked, the train coming in, uh, across the water uh, to Malmö. Uh, by this remarkable crossing that opened in 2001. And once on the Malmö side, uh, you have a, a, a wonderful example of a, the a physical regeneration of an old industrial area, a huge shipyard that shut down, uh, including a new university, and as you'll see, um, the same kind of principle of medium density but not oppressively high density or high-rise housing with very generous 
and very well designed uh, public open space, or rather we should call it semi-public, accessible to the neighborhood uh, uh, for children. And this is very much the same approach as you've seen elsewhere. Um, this is served presently by bus, but there will soon be served by a new extension of the transit system you earlier saw that will go across the edge of development. And so there we are, and next door to it, uh, a, a, about a mile away on the other side of Malmur, you can see uh, yet another example uh, in the rebuilding uh, uh, of, uh, and uh, rehabilitation of a rundown old public housing area. Uh, this remarkable attention to water management, which you also see in all the other schemes. Uh, this is the most uh, re remarkable example of large scale water management we saw. So, to summarize, in these very few cases, and they're all very few and far between, I fear, you are seeing now models uh, for a new kind of development. And the uh, UK government, to do them credit, did try to launch a, an even more ambitious plan a couple of years ago for a series of eco-towns, uh, small Ebenezer hard type garden cities uh, dotted around the English countryside. Uh, and uh, these are to be planned according to the strictest standards of sustainability, and they were all checked and marked as to how far they achieve these standards. Unfortunately, I have to report that um, the, there have been some problems. Many of the developers, they were private developers, dropped out uh, it, because of the current recession and cutback in the building industry. But in fact, the UK government has recently announced a handful of these schemes, some five schemes, will actually go ahead uh, with more to follow. So in these places, um, we are seeing a totally new agenda. Uh, it so happens, if I may be autobiographical to end, that uh, last summer, uh, summer of 08, uh, the UK government uh, invited me and 14 other people uh, to join a challenge panel to look at these eco-town uh, bids. And we found we were meeting a group of people we never met in our lives, doing all kinds of things uh, with all kinds of skills that none of us knew anything about whatsoever. And we were all engaged in a frantic effort to educate each other uh, so that we didn't appear uh, totally ignorant and inadequate when the prospective developers uh, came in front of us. What I think this taught all of us, uh, and uh, next week we're due to all reassemble to say hi to each other and goodbye. I think it'll be goodbye at this point. Um, uh, uh, and talk to the minister who's carrying this program forward. What we learned is that you need a totally new way of developing communities like these. You need new kinds of skills, particularly in sustainable housing development, in sustainable water management, in new forms of energy such as solar and wind power, and how you realize this, and how you put it together in a very high level of urban design. And this is going to require the education of a totally new generation of environmental urban planners in a totally new way. And I'd, I'd like to end, therefore, by making this proposal, and you could call it a plea, uh, what better place to launch uh, such an educational venture than the College of Environmental Design, both uh, developing these skills, linking them together, and above all, contributing the multidisciplinary research that will make uh, other places like these possible. That's quite an agenda, I think, for the next two decades or three, and I'd like to commend it to you. Thank you very much.